Who is Medusa? From ancient times, her story is often misunderstood. There's a link in the description with her full lore, but what you need to know is she is a beautiful woman, one of three Gorgon sisters, turned snake-headed due to a feud with the gods, to put it lightly. So is Castlevania's Medusa actually Medusa? Well, no, she isn't. They are two different beings. The Medusa of Greek mythology was slain by Perseus, well before Alucard's time. But the fairy scroll relic tells us she is indeed her, so how can this be? Well, you see, the scroll tells it like it sees it, so to say. Clearly the image to the right is still Dracula, but the scroll doesn't comprehend the transformation and only shares what lays before it, almost like a child lacking object permanence. It sees a head full of snakes and says, yes, this must be Medusa, even if it isn't. The bestiary confirms our suspicions that the castle's Medusa is indeed a fraud. It reads, snake-headed demoness with a gaze of stone. But in reality, she was a Gorgon, daughter of primordial sea gods, not a demon. Being a demon, much like Dracula's final form against Richter, would point to Medusa being a creature inspired by the castle. In Japanese, Castlevania translates to demon castle after all. So when the Medusa we encounter in the anti-chapel isn't actually Medusa, why is the close proximity here? Well, the answer lies within the corridors of the Long Library. The expansive repository of knowledge contains historical works amongst its hoard of knowledge and acts as a basis to construct the demons and undead we encounter. Now, it should be said that many of the library's works contain knowledge yet to be discovered by humans. Some argue the castle creates these works from its internal chaos, but we shouldn't discount Dracula, a man of science and many talents. It's conceivable the castle contains his literary genius, alongside other yet-to-be-discovered culinary dishes and technologies. Humans adapt the stories found within the castle for their own modern consumption. You'll have seen the same happen with many classic Disney movies, which are largely adaptations of stories told centuries prior. Take, for instance, Snow White, the Disney version is an adaptation of a story told by the Brothers Grimm. Many stories that would be published by humans well after Symphony of the Night have a similar origin. Adaptations of tomes found within the ruined castle, such as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, being derived from the creature. So Medusa, or an approximation, is born from the stories that are contained within the castle. We'll see the same concept with the yet-to-be-humanly available Wizard of Oz and the enemies of the Forbidden Library. Let's take a moment to explore this tale a bit further, as it draws a clearer parallels to the same process used for Medusa. There's a link to a synopsis in the description, but the TLDR is Dorothy is from Kansas, runs away from home to protect her dog Toto, meets Professor Marvel, a traveling snake oil salesman, who convinces her to return home. Once home, she is swept into a tornado. Dorothy and the house are whisked away into the land of Oz and happen to kill the Wicked Witch of the East in the process. To find her way back to Kansas, she is directed to seek the Wizard of Oz down a yellow brick road into the Emerald City. She takes the magical ruby slippers from the witch she's just killed to protect herself on her journey. En route to the Emerald City, she befriends the Scarecrow, Tin Man, and Lion, who each seek the wizard for their own reasons. They meet with the wizard, who directs them to kill the Wicked Witch of the West, who also happens to be after the magical ruby slippers. Like the Brothers Grimm version of many Disney stories, it's quite possible the original telling of The Wizard of Oz held within Castlevania doesn't have a happy ending. Imagine a tale where the Fellowship of Oz fails. Some versions of The Wizard of Oz do allude to this, and the wizard in particular doubted they could actually kill the witch. This version is used to create the Forbidden Library, from its yellow bricked walls to its defenders. So what happens to the Fellowship of the Wizard of Oz story held within the library? The Scarecrow and Tin Men resist, but it's no use. They become twisted images of their true forms. But for the Lion, who is cowardly, he doesn't resist. He willingly joins their forces, and they reward him handsomely with valuable equipment. He remains a coward, though, running away from Alucard and feels shame upon defeat, raising his hand to his face in disgust. So now that we have an understanding of how monsters in the castle are created, we can turn our attention back to Medusa. Let's examine her fight with Alucard. The fight design deserves its own video, but for our purposes right now, why is she looking away? If Perseus was willing to use her head as a weapon and for its petrifying powers, why won't Medusa use them liberally? She's resisting. 
Her neck is trying to look the other way while her head is desperately fighting back to face her adversary. She doesn't even look when deciding to attack. The two panels to the left are literally one frame apart. She only looks at the same moment she swings her sword. It's no wonder she often misses and Alucard can easily duck under her attacks. It's like there's some sort of inner conflict. Something's amiss. So let's recap. Medusa isn't Medusa. She's a manifestation of the literature contained within the castle. She's clearly conflicted and avoids engaging in combat. So who is Medusa? Maybe we should be asking a better question. Where is Dorothy? Well, she certainly isn't a witch. No, no, the story wouldn't bear giving Dorothy the honor of such a title. Destroyer of the Eastern Witch? No, she doesn't deserve to have the right to join their sisterhood. The Witches of Oz discover her encounter with the snake oil salesman, Professor Marvel, and how he gently touched her hair. Perfect. Will manifest Dorothy into a Medusa-like snake-headed monster. They then give her the modified version of the stone gaze, ensuring she could never lay eyes on her friends or her little dog Toto ever again. Her snake legs are rather fitting. While inaccurate to the story of Medusa, they prevent Dorothy from ever adorning the magical ruby slippers she stole from the slain witch of the east. The witches ensure Dorothy could never use their powers to escape. Placing her in the anti-chapel was the icing on the cake. There's no place like home, and Kansas is in the Bible Belt. Her soul will twist and melt under the influence of the anti-chapel's demonic presence, and acts as a key defensive bulkhead to any would-be invaders storming the second castle. Let's not forget the large painting adorning the walls, for this is no ordinary, macabre work of art. The rather unique in its shape, almost as if the upper midsection is breaking the fourth wall, this unique shape serves two purposes. The first is to point skywards, towards the second castle. It reads as a warning to any who would dare consider invading through the keep. Travel upwards and you'll meet your maker. The second is a warning for what's in store. This painting depicts the treachery of the Fellowship of Oz from the perspective of the witches. Dorothy is clearly the center villain. Fitting, the slayer, fitting as the slayer of the witches of the east, the unique shape of the painting reinforces her arrival to Oz from the skies above the clouds. The center skeleton's design is purposeful, as it depicts the skeleton of a woman. The hip ratio in the painting aligns perfectly to a biological female. Of course, we can choose any gender we wish. Dorothy is human, and trans rights are human rights. The castle and the wider Soden community embraces everyone. Returning to the painting, further along we find her little dog Toto, following along to the right, and the Tin Man, with his axe blade plunged securely into a victim. And to the left we find the Scarecrow, holding an appropriate farmer scythe, with the lion behind him, cowering in fear from the distance. All while the Wizard of Oz lurks in the shadows, pulling the strings. Dorothy is supposed to represent all that is good in the world, and it's unsurprising she wouldn't take up arms willingly. The castle knew this, and it's why the heart of Dracula himself is found here. She can resist all she likes, and in the fight we see that she indeed does, but Dracula's influence never fails, and ultimately Dorothy is forced to fight. Alucard, being unaware of any of this, slays what he sees as a beast, sadly ending Dorothy's life in a cold cultist chamber, far away from any place over the rainbow. That's all for this video. If you enjoyed it, there's a like button at the bottom left of your screen. And if you're interested in other things random in Castlevania, there's a link to my Twitch channel in the description. Take care. We should recognize the Medusa shield as a genuine artifact. Perseus used the Medusa's severed head as a weapon. Given Medusa's divine upbringing, it isn't a stretch to imagine the head persisting over the millennia. The description accurately described Medusa's Gorgon origin, and the head can be acquired prior to fighting Medusa in the game. But what about the wizard of all the story is named after? Well, there are two possibilities here. The first being the rarely seen alternative Scarecrow. Some in the Castlevania wiki speculate that this version is actually female, and might be Dorothy. But this is speculation at best, and like many things in the wiki, doesn't hold up to scrutiny. I assume some feel the strip of clothing is a bra, 
a bit of a reach to form an entire basis. Besides, if the character is female, it would make more sense for it to be Glinda, the good witch to the north, rival of the wicked witches. It's more likely that the Castlevania X Chronicles bestiary that this enemy isn't female. Also fitting that the wizard, being a fraud, would be labeled as looking for a brain. Either way, the wizard or Glinda would be much more well known to the inhabitants of Oz, and impaling either for public display would send a much stronger message than Dorothy. The second theory is my favorite. It turns out that the actor who played the wizard in the film, Frank Morgan, also played four other characters. So he plays the following roles, a seemingly intelligent wizard, a snake oil salesman, someone who provides travel services, a guard that only allows those who are worthy to enter, only opening the door when seeing the ruby slippers, of course, and the other guard who mentions he has an aunt Om at home, alluding to having an authority figure. Well, these character traits all seem a bit familiar. Down a yellow brick road, you'll find a man with a job society associates with intelligence, who only serves those who are worthy, and is very mindful of his master at home, providing transportation services, and a bit of a con man for selling us spells that we already inherently know.